I'm going to ask the usual question, which is, yeah. why have you chosen this film? <sighs> well, it was, it's an important film for me personally. It's, I usually say it was the first ex-certificate film that I was able to see. Actually, of course, that's not true, because it was a double bill. The first ex-certificate film I saw was Roger Corman's The Wild Angels, which came round with Dr. Fibes Rises Again in 1973. And I saw it at the Palace Bridgewater. Um, I was 13 years old. We had to do that thing of changing out of school uniform into like really hard looking denims and lowering the voice <laughs> and going. And, and, and of course, we all really believed that the girl behind the ticket desk thought we were 18. You know, I mean, that was part of the ritual. Um, and Actually, in fact, when I saw this, I hadn't seen The Abominable Dr. Fibes. Either. It was a film I was aware of. Um, and as, as a kind of young horror fan, as someone beginning to get interested in, in horror, there was that period between the age of, say, 11 and 13 and, and this movie, where I would stand outside cinemas and think, I will never be old enough to see the house that drip blood, <laughs> yeah. And I would look at the stills and think, yeah, this, this must be like the best film ever, but I'm never gonna see it because, because I'm too young. That, that throbbing sense of injustice um, that I think all kind of horror film fans had to deal with. And also that kind of little thrill of, what if the, yeah, what if the censors were right? What if this stuff was too tough? for, for an, uh, our, our poor, feeble little minds to take. You know, what if we went and saw these films and there were, yeah, that we got irreparable psychological damage, like, um, like some of our teachers said. Um, <laughs> and nevertheless, that wasn't gonna stop us going and seeing these, these, these movies, or this movie in particular. Um, I was aware of it because uh, it was recent, I mean, the first film had been a hit, so the second film was quite well publicized. Um, when it was announced that I was doing this event, um, George Perry, who was film critic on The Observer, emailed me and said that he remember, he was on the set of this movie and he did an interview with Vincent Price and there was a very striking illustration which was a photograph and half the face was Vincent Price and half the face was the, the Dr. Fibes mask. And George said how much he'd enjoyed doing the piece. And that. But I actually remembered that piece. I'd cut it out and put it in a scrapbook. Um, and I had this sort of... Uh, yeah, I did. again, I probably never would be old enough to see this, but we thought, oh, well, the hell with it. We'll give it a try. And some of my um, taller mates had been to see A Clockwork Orange the week before, so we had an idea that the cinema was yeah, maybe a bit lax <laughs> about, about, about letting people in to see these movies. Um, and so, th and th this was 1973, and... Uh, the, the moment when, when we were able to get in and see these films, suddenly a whole world opened up. And, and that was the year, oddly enough, it was the year of Dracula AD 1972, which came out with Trog you know, a, a year after it had been made. Um, and the last film I screened here, Let's Get Jessica to Death, I saw that year in that cinema. Um, I, I saw Frogs, Tales from the Crypt. Uh, the, the kind of the last dying fall of Hammer Films, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. Um, and weirder things, The Haunted House of Horror, Doom Watch. Um, th these were the, the sort of movies that were still turning up on double bills, Tower of Evil and Demons of the Mind. Um, at that point, and they were still in proper cinemas, and you, yeah. And so, um, what I'm saying is that I'm of that generation that predate the we discovered it on television, we discovered it on VHS. For us, we actually had to break the law to see these <laughs> films. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, we had a sort of strange idea of what <laughs> what the law actually was. I don't think any of us had, <laughs> had uh, and there was always always a kind of you know, school legend of the people who'd not got in to see things and had been humiliatingly turned away from, yeah, Bonnie and Clyde or MASH or the Boston Strangler or, or all the, the, the other ex-certificate films at the time. Yeah, uh, there was a sort of, I really hated it when they changed it to 18. There's something dull and boring and unromantic yeah. about 18. Yeah, um, X said something to me. I mean, I'm not old enough to have seen H. I would have loved to see H films, but, but X was still something that, yeah, it, it promised something. And one of my 
favorite reviews ever um, from a, a critic that you probably don't associate me with, with liking very much. Um, Alexander Walker said of Suspiria, is what kids thought X films were like. And he's absolutely spot on. That was the, the film you saw. and said, yes, that when I was 13 years old, that's what I thought an X film was going to be. Um, and I, said, I suppose there was some disappointment among, among the lads that night that Dr. Fibes Rises Again hadn't sort of destroyed us psychologically. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I don't know if there's a not very good Dudley Moore comedy called Crazy People, which is about the advertising industry. And one of the jobs he has is publicizing a horror film. And the slogan he suggests is, is, suggests is this will fuck up the rest of your life. <laughs> um, and <laughs> yeah, and we, I suppose on some level we kind of hope for that. And yeah, I, I suppose I suppose the BBFC protected us from, say, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, <laughs> which probably could have fucked up the rest of our lives. <laughs> um, uh, we got this Dr. Fibes rises again in, instead. I have to say. Um, if given my druthers, I would have actually screened it on a double bill with, with the Wild Angels. And so you've got the full force of, of you know, rebel bikers who just want to be free and Vincent Price murdering a bunch of British character actors. Um, that said, you know, uh, uh, Roger Corman had his place in the, in, on this stage a few weeks back, so we're going with, with Dr. Fives tonight. Um, it's still, it's a film that for me is actually beyond criticism because so much of it is wrapped up in, in what, I was, what I loved as a 13-year-old and still kind of love. Yeah, the, this ambiance, which is, I'm not even sure if camp is a good word for this. There's I a would kind say of so. black, there's a black <laughs> humor there because there's an edge of nastiness to this, which is still real. It, it, if there's a sort of distinctively British version of, of camp, which, which is associated with, say, The Avengers, which is where the director, Robert West, cut his teeth. And you can really see it in, in the, um, the giant gin bottles and, and the, the clockwork orchestra and the kind of weird meld of ancient Egypt and um, the Busby Berkeley, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers iconography that this movie has. Um, it... <laughs> I suppose it is, uh, uh, it's one of the few horror films that has Over the Rainbow on the soundtrack. That's a really brilliant um, 1930s jazz soundtrack, which, which gives it a strange kind of edge as well. Um, it starred, uh, Vincent Price was kind of the horror star of my youth. Um, and he was going into this sort of decadent phase after Witchfinder General, where he was making these films, and then he did um, Theatre of Blood, um, and Madhouse, which is kind of underrated, but which were all sort of self-referential. They were about being Vincent Price uh, and what Vincent Price meant. I think and they're, about the, they're about the Vincent Price that Tim Burton made films about. Um, although this, this also features Peter Cushing in a tiny bit. It's one of those things. He's only in it so they can put him on the posters. Um, <laughs> similar, similarly, Hugh Griffith, though I think is, is astonishing in this. Um, and uh, you know, some of the grunts in here, John Thor is in it. But it also has um, Robert Quarry, who was very briefly a huge horror star on the back of the Count Yorga vampire movies, um, and then didn't go on to be a... Uh, uh, he wasn't particularly a versatile actor, as you see, he's, he's a bit of a, a stiff here. But I think he plays quite well opposite Vincent Price. Uh, he's notionally the hero, but you'd be hard-pressed to like him. Um, I mean, the only thing nice about him is his girlfriend's played by Fiona Lewis, um, who was another really interesting sort of horror presence in, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. One of the things um, that you mentioned was the idea of it being camp, but also very horrific. And the notes that I had when I watched it for the yeah. first time were death by animal, scorpion, yes. snake, Eagle, yeah. which was fantastic when someone looked over my shoulder at my nose. Yeah, well, they really are horrific. Oh deaths. yeah, there are some really. I mean, I think John Thor's in particular is is fairly gruesome, yeah. um, and some some of the other. Yeah, there's a there's a kind of 1950s EC horror comics feel to the 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 deaths, but they are these 
<laughs> yeah, uh, bizarrely ridiculous and extravagant ways of killing people when, frankly, he could just shoot them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but you sort of think, but where would be the fun in that? Yeah. You know? um, well, the other great thing yeah. is this idea that we're, we're, we're led along by this yeah. completely evil villain, but he's <laughs> our protagonist, and well, he's the one that he's we... He's doing it for love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and he's got style, yeah. <laughs> and he seems to have a... Yeah, he's nicer to his minions than the hero is to his. He yeah. has got style. He wears a yeah. tuxedo all the way oh, through. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I love the, 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 the strange robes. And the, and, and, and the other thing is because Vincent Price was sort of known for overacting, here he's playing a wax mask over a face so he can't do all the, the gurning that he usually does. And it shows he actually is quite a subtle overactor. It's still <laughs> way over the top. Um, but it's all done with the eyes now. But it is a huge challenge as well, because yeah. um, for those of you who haven't seen either of the films, I know there might not yeah. be that many of you, um, he's, his face has been horribly disfigured yeah. and he has to wear this wax mask, which also means that he can't speak, and he speaks out of a device that attaches to his neck, which is actually quite a difficult task for an actor. Yeah, and it's wonderful. It, 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 I like, because it's the, the, the 1930s setting, it's a his master's voice gramophone that he has to plug in. With the dog. There's, with the dog. The dog um, from his master's voice has a great role in this film. I mean, I, how they got Parlophone to sign off on the product placement for this, <laughs> yeah, um, if they even bothered, yeah, uh, is, is a, a remarkable thing. Absolutely. And uh, like you say, he's very kind to his minions, including yes. this fantastic yes, very creature glamorous. called Volnavia. Yeah, I have no idea. I, she's sort of a spirit or, a, yeah, she's the equivalent of the hunchbacked assistant, <laughs> but it's much more presentable. Than she enjoys a tableau. Eagle. She's always arranging right. herself perfectly. Yeah, she's kind of a dance partner as well. I think she was originally a nurse, but it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, so, and... This lacks the beautiful ruthlessness of the plot of The Abominable Dr. Fives, which is structured around the 12 plagues of, e plagues of Egypt uh, in the way that Seven is constructed around the Seven Deadly Sins. Um, this is, without that structure, this goes a bit haywire, I have to say, in its, its story. But it still has the, the, the great elaborate and, and uh, gruesome send-offs. Um, in uh, Theatre of Blood, it would be Shakespeare plays used as the inspiration for murders. 